thank you for that. Uh, I'm Fiona Harvey. Uh, I'm the, guard, uh, the Guardian's uh, environment correspondent. Um, and I have uh, uh, written quite a lot recently about uh, oceans and fisheries because there's been unusually uh, some good news uh, in this area uh, quite recently. Uh, we've had uh, some good news coming from Europe uh, on the common, fish common fisheries policy where um, discards uh, are going to be eliminated uh, at some point. We're not exactly sure where at the moment. Um, so that's a, a positive step. Uh, we've had the fish fight campaign that's been spearheaded by Hugh Fernley Whittingstall uh, that's had enormous uh, success uh, and a, a series on Channel 4 with a huge uh, impact. Um, and these are rare moments of good news in what's otherwise a bit of a sea of gloom uh, when it comes to the oceans. Because as we all know, uh, our oceans around the world are in a state of crisis. Uh, overfishing uh, is the, uh, the major problem uh, because that affects uh, huge swathes of the globe. Um, there was a study done uh, a few years ago uh, that found that practically all of the commercial fisheries that we rely on uh, would be effectively uh, exhausted by uh, 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 mid-century if we carry on uh, at the rate we're going, uh, possibly even sooner. Um, we also know that there are huge problems in terms of marine pollution. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we're pumping into the sea uh, around the world uh, is also killing fish stocks. We had a very graphic example of that last year with the uh, BP oil spill. Um, we've got problems also with climate change. Uh, the oceans are a very important uh, carbon sink. Um, and uh, they are becoming uh, saturated, some research suggests, uh, with carbon and will no longer act as such an effective carbon sink in future. Um, that could be quite important uh, for what we think about climate change from now on. Um, and of course we're also seeing a new assault on the oceans in the form of deep sea drilling in very delicate parts of the world, uh, up in the Arctic for instance, uh, around Greenland. So all in all, uh, despite the, the bright spots I was talking about, um, it isn't a wonderful picture of the oceans. So we've got uh, four experts here tonight to talk you through some of the problems, but also, very importantly, we're going to focus on some of the solutions uh, and what can be done uh, about the crisis in our oceans. So I'm going to introduce uh, our speakers now, and we want this to be very uh, interactive. So um, if you'd like to, um, we will open up for, for uh, a, a Q&A session, which will be uh, entirely uh, free and open uh, after our uh, speakers have had a chance to, to set out their stall. But if while they're speaking, uh, or if uh, you know, between speakers, you would like to raise a point or ask a question, then please do so. We, 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 we can do that as well uh, before we move into the formal Q&A afterwards. Is that all okay? Good. Right, so first up, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Don <coughs> Henriksen, um, who is uh, an award-winning writer and editor. He's written uh, Our Common Seas and Coastal Waters of the World, uh, the trends, threats and strategies uh, thereof. Um, he's the Senior Development Manager for the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, uh, and he's also a member of the Frontline Club. Don. Thank you. Well, one of the things I want to address right away is the one of the critical things that we're confronting coastal and ocean areas is the tremendous growth of coastal populations. We're seeing, I mean, already 10 years ago, at least half of humanity was living on a coastline or within 100 kilometers of one. Now, the UN data for the, the round of the recent round of censuses hasn't come out yet, but when the UN Population Division does issue that, I would imagine that that, that percentage has increased. I mean, already in just in 2000 to 2005, it looked like cities like Dar es Salaam in Sub-Saharan Africa were growing by 4% a year. That's enough to double your population within 16 years, and that's not the only that's not the only coastal city in developing countries that's that's exploding in population. There are a lot of reasons for this, mainly because uh, many of these countries are not invested in rural infrastructure at all. People are drawn to cities because that's where they can have a better life. They have jobs, they have uh, education, they have healthcare, and so on. But 
at the same time there's masses of people immigrating to these coastal cities or near shore or cities that are close to shorelines and coastal areas are incapable for the most part of, it, of accommodating this kind of growth. So we're seeing exponential growth in coastal cities in areas where they're not really able to accommodate that growth in any sustainable fashion. So you have exploding populations. At the same time, you've got the degradation of coastal ecosystems because cities are expanding uh, along the coastlines. They're expanding inland. They're also expanding into the coastal areas. Um, and this is having an immediate impact on critical coastal resources such as mangroves, seagrasses, and coral reefs. These are the big three. We're losing all of them. A tremendous, it, it, it's a tremendous loss. Um, we don't really know how much is being lost because the studies simply have been done, but I think my colleagues would probably be able to update us on what the most recent stats are in terms of these three critical ecosystems. But you have to remember the oceans are, are the source of all life on the blue planet, and, and they're important for the maintenance of life support systems. And we're losing this capacity. We are losing it. It's not just the loss of fisheries. It's not just the loss of these critical coastal ecosystems. It's also massive amounts of pollution going on. I mean, we have now 400 dead zones literally dead zones where there's literally <coughs> so little oxygen in the water column that it doesn't support any life higher, higher than microorganisms and bacteria. 400 of them, that's doubling of the, in the last 10 years. There are now some, something like, um, I think they're covering almost 95,000 square kilometers just in these dead zones. These are mostly in the off the coast of developed countries. We don't even know uh, what, what they're like in developing countries because the studies simply haven't been done. Obviously, the, the, the East China Sea, for example, has got I mean, it's, in a, it's in a massive load of, of waste that's going in there, both from untreated sewage, partially treated and <coughs> municipal and industrial waste, agricultural runoff. There's a, there's, most of these coastal areas are simply dead. Plus, they're being overfished. So you, you've got a complete collapse of these ecosystems that's going on globally, not just in developed countries, but all over. Um, and this, this is something that we have to address. And it, frankly, it's not being addressed. When I when I I just done another book called the, the Atlas of Coasts and Oceans, uh, and I was looking for success stories to put into this. I could find almost nothing. But the worst thing was when I was starting to examine uh, management strategies that have put in place over the last 20 to 30 years. For example, the UNEP's regional seas programs. They have 13 of them. The first one was 1975 in the Mediterranean. I wrote Ironically, that's one of the few that's still going because the Mediterranean countries have actually put up an infrastructure, they have a budget, they have management capacity, uh, and they have enforcement mechanisms in place. Most of the other 13 regional seas that, they, that they've launched since 75 have none of this anymore. The governments simply have let them atrophy and die. And, and this is a tragedy because it's one of the mechanisms that was set up to allow countries to actually manage collectively coastal and ocean resources is not being done. The best, the best examples I could find are sort of bilateral efforts or efforts around sort of the Baltic, which is also collapsed, but at least the Baltic Environment Protection Plan, which is called HELCOM and is managed by uh, out of Helsinki, uh, again, at least has a management plan, a budget, and enforcement capacity. So they are making progress. The Baltic is slowly recovering, uh, but there's a long way to go. But there are so few examples of this that it's it's just tragic and it's it's depressing when you have to when you as me as a researcher and writer looking at what's happening and and trying to come up with some some elements of hope it's it's very difficult it's very depressing and i think that this is this is an an issue which is not covered enough in the media either uh, I was talking to Fred Pierce about this just last week. We had dinner together. We were discussing what we could do to sort of elevate some of these issues. And it's hard because one, media media competence in this area is shrinking. It's not growing. There are hardly any environment correspondents anymore. You, you, they've, they've sort of been combined into science correspondents. And it's it's a, it's a pity there are more of this. When I was started out 30 years ago as a, as a reporter for New Scientist out of Scandinavia, there are environment correspondents all over the place. And now you see very few of them. So this, this is another problem. Um, 
I don't, frankly, as, as a media, you know, proponent myself, I don't really know how to deal with this. It's 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 tragic. Um, I think I'll stop there and take some questions. If anybody has any of those, so I could turn it over to Alex, who could go over to more details about what we're really facing. You've got a question here at the back. But what is very important also exercise of atomic bomb on this water. That is destroying a lot. All uh, uh, infrastructure of... Uh, did you understood what I'm saying? You're no. talking about the atomic... Exp the Explosion exercises under yes. the water. And the for South example, Pacific I don't elsewhere. remember which islands, Barbados or Bahamas, uh, American makes in the deepest uh, place exercises. All the time. All the time. And they pay for it. And they uh, say that it's not, not dangerous. But every country does it. And it's tragic. Tragic. Why we should make exercise with atomic bomb and destroy our nature? Sure. Well, I we are prison of evil or we are prison of God? <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree. There haven't been any atmospheric tests uh, for some time, uh, although the U.S. was testing in the South Pacific uh, for some years. And those islands, I think that they were, they were testing on are still basically uninhabitable and will be for God knows centuries. So that that was really an excuse. You're right. In the sense, that's inexcusable. But I think it's. I don't know of any atmospheric testing going on any any longer. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. North Korea, I think, is. Well, that's a lot. That's yes. A lot fun, yeah. yes. North Korea. Yes. That's. Leave North Korea alone for a moment. But um, uh, by the way, uh, I think the gentleman was saying there's a seat here, so, uh, and I think there's a, there may also be a seat here and here for, for people at the back, just to let you know. Um, I mean, you, you, you can perch there if you like, but there are here as well. Um, uh, great, well, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, we've had a, a, a tragic picture there uh, painted by, by Don. Um, Alex, this is uh, uh, Alex uh, Rogers here, uh, I think may only be making things worse. Um, <laughs> uh, Alex is Professor in Conservation Biology uh, at the Department of Zoology at the University of Oxford. Uh, he's uh, come down from Oxford today. His uh, research is mainly on the uh, diversity, ecology, conservation and evolution uh, of marine species. And um, Alex, I, I believe that you're a founder member of the IPSO project, the, uh, which stands for the International Programme on the State of the Ocean for anyone who doesn't already know, um, which of course is um, is uh, releasing new scientific findings at the moment. And you'll be able to tell us whether we should be jumping for joy or uh, joining our sorrows. <laughs> yes, uh, well I, th I think the best thing for me to do is, is really to follow on uh, from what uh, Don said about the services that, that the ocean provides to us. Mm -hmm. um, for example, one out of every two breaths you take in this room comprises oxygen that's mm -hmm. produced by microscopic plants in the surface of the oceans. Uh, the oceans provide us with food, something between 80 to 90 million tonnes of it per, per annum. Um, they are uh, responsible or, or uh, certainly play a major role in many of the Earth's um, uh, major nutrient cycles. They actually regulate the temperature of the planet. So the oceans provide us with a huge number of goods and services and they're really just the ones that we can actually see and put some form of, of value on. Um, if we take that down to single ecosystems, I can give, give a, a one example of coral reefs. These actually cover a tiny fraction uh, of the ocean, something like 0.16%, I think it is, Charles. It's certainly less than 1%. Uh, it's been estimated that they confer a value to humankind uh, somewhere up to $375 billion per annum. And that's just in the things that we can count. 30 million people's livelihoods are directly dependent on coral reefs. Uh, perhaps half a billion people derive something from coral reefs in terms of food or other, other goods and services. And that's one tiny fraction of the marine environment. The deep ocean, which is something like a billion cubic kilometers of water, is the world's biggest carbon storage system. And in fact, the oceans are doing, this, or have been doing, this fantastic service of, uh, of absorbing carbon dioxide, which we've been producing. 
and I'll come back to the effects of that in, in a second. Um, the IPSO program was really brought about to look at, at the oceans in a very holistic way and to look at all of these functions as a whole in terms of what they provide for the Earth's life support system. And what we seem to be facing now is a situation where we have multiple impacts on many parts of this system which have actually weakened uh, the oceans in, in many, many different ways. So they've d decreased the resilience of many marine ecosystems to future human impacts. And the big one that we all know about is climate change. Fishing in particular is one uh, form of impact or overfishing that we know has these types of effects in particular. We're now in a situation where uh, the annual catches uh, of wild fish from the oceans is in decline. And that decline is set to continue uh, into the future unless we do something about uh, the way our fisheries are managed. The big ocean predators, we're talking about things here like sharks, tunas, uh, marlin, swordfish. Uh, many of those have been reduced to less than 10% of their virgin stock biomass or their, 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 the, the original size of their populations. And some of those species, less than 1%. This has all happened in the last 50 years. And in fact, in my lifetime, we went from a situation where global fisheries, marine fisheries, were growing to a situation where they're now in decline. The speed of change is simply breathtaking and beyond anything that we've seen in geological history in terms of the impact of one species uh, on many others, I would say. Fishing has many other impacts on ecosystems. It actually alters their structure. And it's because of this alteration of structure that it, it reduces the resilience of ecosystems to other shocks and impacts. Um, and this is, uh, this is one particular concern when we come to climate change uh, effects. Certainly, we've got very strong evidence now that overfishing on, for example, coral reefs reduces their ability to recover from bleaching events, which is something which is occurring as a result of rising ocean temperatures. Um, with regards to uh, the other forms of impacts we're, ha we're having, uh, pollution is an old enemy, if you like, that simply hasn't gone away. We don't often hear about it nowadays. And indeed, in the past, we have been successful at tackling certain aspects of, of pollution. So, for example, CFCs and the ozone hole. But what we find now is we're dealing with a mixture of the legacies of old pollution events, if you like, but also new uh, substances which we're pouring into the marine environment. So just remember when you're putting on your shower gel or you're washing your clothes in something that smells pleasant, those, those, uh, those materials contain uh, substances called artificial musks. And where are those substances going? Straight into the oceans. Uh, I could mention a, a broad range of other things which we've got used to using every day uh, uh, as people and a lot of that stuff ends up going into the sewage system and out into the oceans. Agriculture is a huge source of pollution in terms of pouring nutrients into the oceans and this is one of the main drivers of uh, these dead zones that, that Don's already mentioned. These nutrients enrich the oceans and phytoplankton growth goes out of control. Those uh, plant cells die, they sink in the water column, they're broken down by bacteria and they just use up all the oxygen in the water column. Or you get a burst of growth of toxic algae and they poison everything in the water column. And these dead zones are spreading. Finally, I'm, I'm going to come on to climate change. Um, many people talk about climate change and I find this amazing in terms of something that's going to happen in the future. We have been seeing severe impacts from climate change in the oceans since at least the late 1970s. At least the late 1970s. Those impacts are increasing in terms of their severity and 
uh, in terms of their frequency. Uh, Charles will talk uh, specifically about coral reefs and the impacts of coral bleaching. But the other evil twin of this ocean warming is something called ocean acidification. This is where the oceans have been doing this service for us in mopping up some of the excess CO2 we've been producing. Unfortunately, that's converted to carbonic acid in seawater. That alters the balance between bicarbonate and carbonate in, in seawater. What you may not realise is that many marine animals build their skeletons out of carbonate, calcium carbonate. So corals which form reefs build their skeletons out of a form of calcium carbonate called aragonite. The calcareous algae that bind reefs together also build their skeletons out of calcium carbonate. Many of the small organisms in, planktonic, in, in the plankton also build their skeletons out of calcium carbonate. We have even discovered that this decrease in pH which we're seeing in the oceans, this acidification process, even interferes with the ability of marine organisms to uh, chemically perceive their environment. So we're seeing a situation where Nemo really can't find his way home because he can't smell it anymore. Um, and us as scientists have really been caught uh, caught short on this problem. We're really playing catch up to try to understand what the true implications of ocean acidification are in the marine environment. The last thing I would like to say is that ocean acidification and warming and deoxygenation of the water column are symptoms of massive disturbance in the carbon system of the planet. And those types of, of disturbances we've seen in the geological record, and they're always associated with mass extinction on the planet. And that is the level of uh, severity of the problems that we are facing if we don't act very, very quickly to try and stem the amount of CO2 that's being poured into the atmosphere. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, there you go. Uh, all the many myriad ways in which we're actually um, trashing the oceans uh, laid out in some detail there. <coughs> Everything from your shampoo to the car you drive. Um, do we have any questions mm. specifically for uh, Alex now, or, or should we move to the next speaker and take questions later? Yeah? All right, that's fine. Um, <coughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. Charles, you're up next. Um, okay. I'm going to call on Professor, professor Charles Shepard, who um, is a professor at the Department of Biological Sciences, uh, which is at the University of uh, Warwick. He's been a, a tropical marine environmental advisor for the FCO, um, and he's also um, he's the he's been the, uh, an advisor for the uh, uh, author for the IPCC um, and various other things. But he's also the uh, chief editor uh, of what I believe is the largest uh, marine scientific journal, is that right? The Marine, well, marine Environmental Journal, yes. Right, yes. excellent, so, which is the Marine Pollution Bulletin. Um, and I think you also um, organised the protection uh, of the Chagos uh, Marine Protection Zone, didn't you? You, yes. that you were a prime mover behind that. Yes. So, um, speaking from, from your perspective then, we've, we've heard quite a lot about uh, you know some of the problems um, that we're facing. Mm. Um, what kind sure. of state are we in? I'll make it even more gloomy. Uh, how many of you at, at, at school, I learned at school, the first two rules of ecology are there's no such thing as a free lunch and everything is linked to everything else. Now these are trite but they're also absolutely true and that's what we've lost sight of. Um, I go to a lot of, well a lot of my research places in Africa in all the basket case places around the world. Um, I passed people who've died because of disturbance to their habitat through malnutrition. I passed villages which have been evacuated because they can't get any more fish and these are fishing villages. Um, I want to dispel the idea that these problems are something for the future. In these sort of areas it's in the past and for a lot of villages and for a lot of people it's in the past. Um, we, I, I, I think we in Britain don't live in the environment. We have Tesco's between us and the environment, if you see what I mean. But out in Africa, they're in it. They've got to catch fish 
that day in order to um, live. And it's a salutary fact that, that uh, over half, 55% was the latest figure I was, of under five mortality in these parts of the world are through malnutrition because their habitats have become exhausted because we've screwed up the, the marine ecosystems. Now, if the country had a death certificate, it would have on it not smallpox, that's eradicated, but uh, maybe measles or malaria or something like that. But I mean, I've had malaria, I've had measles, and I'm alive because you know I'm young and fit and everything. So will you? But if you were malnourished, you would die from it, and it kills so many people every year. And that's why I say I go to villages. I've seen it, which where half the people have died in the last two or three year span through malnutrition because they can no longer get their resources from that habitat and this is a lot to do with overpopulation and so on which has been a taboo subject up to very recently but I've been abused at a few meetings by raising the whole population issue you know I've been told I'm a people killer and, and things like that um, but you cannot address a question you can't reach a solution and this guy's going to tell us all the answers um, <laughs> you can't solve an equation if you're not allowed to talk about one of the terms in that equation and that has been a handicap through the UN system for a long time and others the EU system don't mention uh, um, sort of numbers of people Muslims don't like it, Catholics don't like it, a lot of people, human rights people don't like it for the wrong reasons you know how about the human rights of those who have um, sort of died my own work when I, I get a chance is about coral reefs, is on reefs um, I do have the pleasure of going to some really good areas, the few remaining ones which are left, but most of it, I'm afraid, are ex-reefs, you know, sort of, sort of like the Monty Python's parrot. Not sleeping, dead, it really is. In broad terms, about a quarter of the reefs in the world are dead, a quarter are going to be dead in a few years' time because nothing is being, being done about them. A quarter have the chance of getting back together again if people get their act together. Um, and a quarter are in good condition. And as we heard before, they, they supply the protein and shoreline protection for, and this is a guess, several hundred million people, probably more. On the shoreline, they <coughs> eat only fish as you because you're inland a bit more than half fish, half the chickens, and, and so on like that. But everybody knows, don't they, that the sea is an infinite resource of protein, so when there's a war, when there's displacement, when there's overpopulation, people go to the shore and get out the fish. And I've done three projects now to try and estimate, for the country concerned, um, everyone's moved to the shore because of war or whatever it is like that, um, but this infinite source of fish that everyone thought was there just isn't there anymore, is it? Because they've overfished it. And one key point about reefs as well is that if you overfish, sure, you overfish, but what that component does to the whole food chain, to that ecosystem, to use the old-fashioned term, is to mess it up badly. So it falls over, so it can no longer support us, basically. And looking at it from a purely human point of view, the reef can live without us, but we, or well, these people, can live without reefs. Now, I've explained this to a government, I mean, I'm not going to tell you who he is, uh, and he said to me, you know, oh, well, yeah, they're a long way southeast of Dover, aren't they? And, you know, that, that was, I promise you, that's true. Uh, and um, when your local school's closing, your hospital's closing, you know, David Beckham lost that goal or something like that, that's what gets into the newspaper. Not the fact that 10 million people in East Africa died last year because of malnutrition, because they've overfished and messed up their resources, because they've added pollution onto it, because there's a dead zone there, because of agriculture on land, and the sea's not independent of the land. When you have the runoff, it all goes into the sea, and so on. Um, So, you know, I, I blame journalism. There you are. There, it, it, it's <laughs> one editor of a newspaper once said to me, if I don't leave my audience indignant at the end of every issue, then I failed. And I can see that he's got to flog the newspapers, hasn't he? But basically, you know, something the Spice Girls... I'm showing my age now. There was once a pop group called the Spice Girls, my daughter tells me. <laughs> something they do will sweep... 10 million people dying in Africa off the front page. They will. What can we do about it? I don't know. I think we should be asking you how to get these news stories on. Now, I guess people don't like bad news all, all the time. Um, it is 
kind of difficult and it can and I have experience of one incident in, in particular of a very small group agitating to undo what I think is a lot of good and what the Indian Ocean in this case needs. We can talk about that at a, if, if, if you like a later um, time. So when um, the coral reef system which is the world's most diverse ecosystem if you take away the beetles as you know uh, Darwin said God was inordinately fond of beetles. If you take beetles away coral reefs are the most sort of biodiverse system on the planet not just in the sea. They're also so highly productive and they support so many people, you know. You do your field work in Africa. I've got two PhD students there now who are interviewing people on food security, which our government has just got hold of the idea of food security, it seems. And um, you talk to people, they've had 16 children, only eight are alive still. Mm -hmm. Well, there must be better ways of doing it. And there are. Some of it is taboo. Family planning centres, ouch. You know, that you'll get a ton of bricks on you if you start talking about that. It goes bigger than ecology. It really does. It goes into human perception of of how we treat the natural world, forgetting that the natural world is what is keeping us kind of going, you know. Um, uh, well, why don't I um, stop there? One, one point I would make is uh, you talked about some of the good news from the EU, and that is right. The EU admitted the best thing about that came out of the EU ever, if you like, is last year they admitted their fisheries policy was catastrophically wrong. <laughs> wow. Well, that's pretty good because they're that sort of politicians, aren't, aren't they? Mm. The IOTC, the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, likewise last year, to its credit, actually commissioned a report to say, did we do it right? Well, as all the indicators are falling downhill fast, uh, the diversity of tuna in any one hall, the numbers of tuna that are there and this sort of thing, the answer is obviously no, but they actually admitted it. Well, maybe that's a chink in the, that's, what's my metaphor, I've got them all mixed up. You know, the door might be open a crack if they at last start to admit that. Now, I, I'm afraid to say that it should be people like you and me who run the world, but it's not. It's lawyers and accountants, right? But um, basically, I also teach an environmental law course to our law school, and it's really been an eye-opener. Are there any lawyers in here before I go on? No, good, good. Well, basically, if you boil it down, and the lawyers there have admitted it to me, they are basically legislating in the EU, fish must breed more. Well, great, go tell it to the fish, you know. <laughs> you, you forgot to do that. You just can't make these kind of laws. We have got to interact with the environment because we're part of it, but we've also got to interact in a way which isn't going to screw it up completely. And it's not something for the future. Half the reefs of the world, if they're not already dead, will be dead, and nothing you or I can do about it. And that equals many tens of millions of people a year who are going through hardship to the extent of death. Now that's not terribly cheerful, is it? But as I said, you know, you, you kind of lose... Um, well, we smile all the time and give the positive message, right? But in private, I think the smiles do get a bit sort of hysterical in it. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Yes, would, the, would anyone like to respond to, to any of that before we, we go on to... To all the answers. Everyone, everyone, everyone <laughs> thoroughly de depressed by now. We've got a question here and one here. <coughs> Um, thanks, Charles. I, I was just wanted to say that um, while not wanting to avoid any taboo subjects, um, that I think something that um, I've been surprised to find out more about is the degree to which the European Union is active in um, putting its, or rather not putting its flags on, but fishing further and further afield mm -hmm. uh, in the global south to supply the demand uh, for fish within the European Union. And, uh, and that's something which hopefully the CFP will will also attempt to address, but I, I think the, the degree of imports of fisheries products into the EU is, is pretty staggering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well it is, I've experienced that with the Chagos Marine Protected Area. The main opponents there are the tuna industry, mm -hmm. who, ha they've been ferocious. Anyone here from the tuna industry? <laughs> well, I'm not on their Christmas card list anymore, put it that way. Uh, they admitted to me that they take a third of the biomass of tuna in the Indian Ocean every year. They also said that in other oceans, and the Indian Ocean is the worst off for regulation, mm -hmm. the under-reporting of tuna is threefold. Now even I can multiply a third by three. Uh, it's, they breed very quickly, but it 
it's a free for all, isn't it? There's there's no ownership, right? It all sounds very nice. Freedom of the oceans, all that. It goes back to Grotius or Van de Groot, uh, 16, whatever, 15, something like that. Um, it's a nice idea, but you don't get, if you don't have ownership, I'm not advocating ownership specifically, but if, because we haven't had ownership, it's a Klondike, and people go out there and just catch it, because if I don't, he will. And, as was shown for whaling in the 70s, talking about this earlier, it was shown that um, from the whaling company perspective, catch them all now is the thing to do. Then you can, if, if they go extinct, well fine, I've paid for my ship, I can shift the money into automobile spare parts or something like that. These are multinationals. It's the same with fish farming that we're seeing now. It's the same with tuna now. If they all go, the account is what I call the tyranny of the spreadsheet. The annual cycle as well. If you don't do it now and fulfill it now, you won't, it doesn't matter what happens next year. You won't be in business to do anything anyway. It's like this ecotourism nonsense, you know. Ecotourism, it sounds great, but the eco stands for economic. It doesn't stand for ecological. <laughs> After all, it's got to be economic or it won't be there next year. And their accountant mm -hmm. will tell you that. And if you are a Hilton, I mean, even Hilton's eco hotels now, aren't they? Um, if you're the accountant of that company, you're going to tell everyone, your shareholders are going to scream for your blood, and you won't get your bonus, if you don't make it economic now. You won't be here to be eco, ecological next year. So it's a lot of the hype, and the, uh, you know, that's kind of dispiriting sometimes. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, we had a question here. Um, you mentioned that um, on the coast of East Africa that they've overfished the coast or the Indian Ocean has been oh overfished yes. by they. But having, I've just come back from Kenya and spoke to a lot of local fishermen who are so angry at the Kenyan government for selling their fishing rights to the Japanese. And I think it's really important to clarify who the they are because if we're sure. really going to address this situation then it, we've sure. got to address... And, and I, another point about um, Japanese fishing is that I've seen other documentaries where it said that over 50% of the world's fishing stocks go through Japanese markets every day, um, and yet we don't seem to be doing much about the Japanese overfishing of, of the world's oceans. And no, it was a Japanese scientist who won the Emperor's Gold Medal for Marine Science, you know, uh, he, was a, he was a person, not a non-entity, told me when I said what about this, he, he said, uh, well, we, uh, we don't believe we owe anything to any other species. <laughs> uh, you can't kind of an answer that. You're absolutely right. It's not only the Japanese, though. It's Chinese. Working in Madagascar recently, mm. the Chinese, well, they bought most of Africa now, it seems. They certainly bought a lot of Madagascar. They're going up and down. These people, they didn't deal with money. They, you know, I'll catch fish for you. You fix the roof of my house, this sort of stuff. It sounds nice. It's a very difficult life. You know, child mortality is terrible and everything like that. It's not something to look at through rose-tinted glasses. I mean, um, they have moved in and have trucks going up and down the coast now buying for money and they show magazines of adverts you know you could buy this I'll give you a dollar you catch me 50 kilos of fish when I come by next week and they will um, it, it's the Chinese and the Japanese are bandits <laughs> The Chinese who say they're not fishing themselves, they're actually just paying. They buy it. Yeah. Uh, they will go in with that, and of course a fishing license, you know, it, it, it can be $50,000 to, he's a minister, who will issue the license. It's quite easily done. It's very easily done. And you, you get situations like I've seen, um, DDT, okay, we don't have it here, we banned it, so we flog it to Africa. Um, we can measure DDT down to, well, down to nanomolar levels, right, with our instruments. We have what I call the standard African handful. They pick it up, chuck it in the water to kill the fish. They eat it. Mm. You ask them, um, but isn't that going to kill you? Oh yes, but it won't kill me for two years. If I don't get fish, my family will be dead by the end of the month. Ouch. Ouch. And then you have dynamite fishing, cyanide fishing, and all this sort of stuff like that. It, okay, this in Indonesia, a dynamite fisherman, and of course that destroys the habitat, so there's no fish tomorrow. Right? A dynamite fisherman, this information is three or four years old, earns three times what a university professor earns. Now, you might have your views about the value of university professors, but that puts it in perspective. And 
And if he destroys that area, well, when he destroys that area, he'll move on to the next bit. He doesn't have to worry himself. Other people will. So it's the economic drivers of this which, which are doing it. And it's so skewed by the demand. Uh, the Arabian Gulf, I do a lot of work there. Um, the fish stocks have gone. They're all completely collapsed, totally. They buy fish from somewhere else. Oh, that's all right, we can buy it from Indonesia. So one sheikh told me. I mean, a sheikh with gold trim, he was the minister, or well, he owned his country. Um, trouble is, with that, is they were buying it from Indonesia. Indonesians are waking up to the fact that, ouch, we've blown up our reefs, there's nothing left. We can't sell it. I can either sell it or I can feed my family. So they're no longer selling it. So the price will go up and this sort of stuff, which has a temporary sort of sop. You know, people will sell some for a bit more. It's a vicious circle. Hey, it's a sad story, isn't it? Blimey. Yeah, OK. That's, uh, <laughs> that's quite... I, I, I feel like a, a reef that's been devastated. It's just, it's, um, there's a, a, a lady here with a question yes, before we move on. I'll be quicker. Yes, um, I just wondered, in the areas where there are dead zones on, on the coast, are there any, do you have any examples of, of sort of the authorities, you know, seeing that as a bit of a warning signal, taking some action? Well, I think in the Baltic, they, they have taken some actions to try and reduce the amount of uh, agrochemicals pouring into uh, the Baltic and also sewage as well. But I mean, the big, uh, second biggest dead zone, in the, which is actually in the northern Gulf of Mexico, mm -hmm. um, I don't think we've seen <coughs> much action there at all. No. Um, and it's something like 30% of all the nitrate that's flowing into the Atlantic is coming down the Mississippi River. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, which is a huge, huge input of macronutrients into that that system, and that that's why that dead zone is appearing uh, annually. And um, you know, that's where the Deepwater Horizon disaster uh, occurred recently as well. So yeah. I would guess there's likely to be interaction between those two things. So things not looking up there. Yeah. Not really, no. Um, uh, it, I mean, the, the, the problem is that the more water warms up, the less oxygen it holds. It's just a matter of physical chemistry. So these problems are exacerbated by the effects of climate change. You heard how the BP want to rebadge themselves as beyond petroleum? <laughs> you heard that one. <laughs> Brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, yeah, sorry, we've got a, a comment um, over here. Sticking with, okay, sticking with advanced countries where we may have more influence, possibly. Um, I just wondered if there is a proven link between the growth of jellyfish, which smother the whole of the northeast coast of Australia, and the acid, uh, the agricultural runoff and deoxygenation of the water. Because that's a complete no-go zone without stinger suits. And it's yeah, I mean, the... the um, <coughs> Sometimes you get blooms of these animals naturally, and sorting out what's natural variation versus what, something that's new and something which is unnatural is quite difficult. But certainly there seems to be an unholy trinity, if you like, uh, between eutrophication, overfishing, and the introduction of invasive species. Um, so essentially uh, we're pouring nutrients into these systems which, as I said, boosts phytoplankton growth. What we've also done in some areas is we've fished out the fish which prey mm -hmm. on those plankton communities. And coupled with that we've introduced some form of gelatinous invertebrate. Um, that just goes out for control. A good example of this is the Black Sea where uh, basically the predatory fish were fished out. There was then a fishery for anchovy, I think it was, Black Sea anchovy. Uh, that fishery uh, was, was being hammered. At the same time, they were pouring, pouring nutrients into that enclosed body of water. Um, then uh, an organism called Nemeopsis lydii was introduced. It's one of these really beautiful cone jellies, or sea gooseberries, that you may see on TV, with these flickering rows of cilia that 
reflect the refract the light and produce these wonderful colours. The problem was that Nemeopsis loves to chow down on fish larvae. Um, so they just went berserk and wiped out the fishery, more or less overnight. We went from a fishery worth 17 million uh, US dollars per year down to well, well below a million uh, dollars per, per annum. There has been some recovery in that system, um, but that's an example of where you can get these interactions between these different uh, things happening. And certainly in seas off Asia, uh, we're seeing similar similar things going on. Uh, in Europe, there have been these jellyfish plays, but I think there's controversy there over whether we're seeing something uh, related to uh, weather patterns just blowing things on shore uh, or whether there's an actual bloom. So it, it's a very complicated situation, but we do we do have an inkling of how these multiple disturbances on systems can lead to these outbreaks of uh, these these slimy creatures. And in fact, a um, uh, uh, marine biologist coined this phrase: uh, the rise rise of slime. Uh, for these types of uh, situations, and uh, this is quite serious. It's literally where we're bombing these ecosystems back to a Paleozoic state. <laughs> we're taking out all the uh, organisms which we consider as quite advanced, you know, the fish, vertebrates, and so on, and we're literally smashing those ecosystems down to to uh, uh, you know Cambrian-like situation. So. Okay. Thank you very much. So there we go. Where um, uh, our effect is taking us back to to the oceans of prehistory. Um, I have a well, short question. Excuse me. I'm just wondering if we have all these problems with overfishing and pollution, why doesn't the UN take action? They ought to be able to see it our <laughs> in the future. <laughs> It's funny we've got, we've, we've got some things to say to the UN, which we'll yeah. talk about in a minute. I think I think we, we're going to get on to that uh, in a second because before uh, we all um, uh, let's see too much uh, gloom in the picture, um, I'd like just to introduce our final speaker, um, who is Richard Page, uh, and he has promised uh, to uh, come in tonight with some solutions. Um, Richard uh, comes from uh, Greenpeace. Uh, he's one of Green. Peace International's uh, main oceans campaigners, um, uh, particular responsibility for uh, the campaign for a network of marine reserves, which would eventually, uh, Greenpeace hopes, cover about 40% uh, of the oceans. That would be from a very small number, I'm guessing, at, at present. Yeah. yeah. But um, you've got some solutions for us uh, tonight, Richard, but I I'm just noting here that I think you've been at Greenpeace for 18 years, so why haven't you solved it already? I started as a volunteer. I only really intended to stay for a couple of weeks and uh, I got stuck in the sort of campaign honeypot really. Um, but what started me off as an oceans campaigner uh, was the campaign against whaling. You know I saw that when I was a young teenager and I saw the guys in an inflatable against the Russian whalers uh, where they were filming a Russian whaler, there's a sperm whale the other side and the harpoon goes shooting over their heads and uh, I saw that bit of film and it blew me away and I just thought I'm with those guys. Funnily enough it took me sort of about a decade to actually sort of from leaving college to 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 to, to, to work with Greenpeace partly because my father sort of said oh nobody ever gets a gets a job with Greenpeace and I didn't want to you know prove him right. Um, I got there and uh, of course, one of the good things about Greenpeace is it has had some victories, and one of those, this first oceans victory, was really the moratorium on whaling. Uh, other groups were, of course, involved, but Greenpeace had a lot to do with that, and the media had a lot to do with it, and how Greenpeace used the media had a lot to do with it. That image of the, of the harpoon being fired over an inflatable, everybody who saw that remembers it, and it struck a chord. So, uh, the media has an incredibly important part to, to, to play in if we're going to save our oceans. So after the sort of whaling campaign went on, the next kind of big oceans campaign was against the so-called walls of death. This is where a good bit of media branding can, can help your campaign, the, the high seas drift nets. Yeah. And uh, it was a very successful campaign. It got rid of these 
sort of vast nets that were basically anything that swam into them got 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 killed. What we did find, though, as a, as a result of that, one of the consequences was was that the number of long lines in the oceans increased. And there are another fishing gear which are also uh, yeah. probably better than drift nets, but. You know, they have massive implications in terms of bycatch of seabirds. You've probably all seen photographs of albatross hooks, hook, hooked on, on, on long lines, etc. And, um, you know, as well as the tuna oil, all, all, all the two fish that you're trying to catch, there, you'll be getting other things too. You'll be getting your sharks and your turtles and, uh, and everything else. And the, sort of in the first 10 years of Greenpeace's Oceans campaign, Basically, what we found is that we were there were all these problems, and we were kind of choosing battles and fighting particular issues. And in a way, the problem was shifting else elsewhere. So I suppose in the sort of 2002, 2003, we started sort of analysing our work that we'd, we, we, we'd uh, done so far and, and, and how we should be campaigning and, you know, what is the solution to the oceans crisis. And one of the things that was coming up very strongly through the scientific literature uh, was the value of, of marine protected areas and in particular marine reserves. And by marine reserves, what I mean is a special kind of marine protected area that basically prohibits all extractive use, including fishing, but that would include sort of oil drilling or whatever, and, 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 and tries to get rid of all the destructive uses. So you can still sail across a marine reserve and use it for sort of science and other benign uses, but you're basically closing off areas of ocean um, and letting it re either sort of keep its natural, its natural state as it can, or, or, or it, what we've found is that where marine reserves have been instigated, you actually get build up, if, if the environment has been degraded, you get more, more organisms, you get bigger organisms because they can grow larger because they're not being fished, you get a greater variety of, uh, uh, of organisms mostly, although some changes, you know, if you've got a very degraded system, it can change in unexpected ways. And the these areas are it's a way uh, 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 of protecting, protecting the ocean. They're not a panacea for everything. They can't stop your ocean acidification You've got a, or, or, or your climate change or your pollution from land. But they're probably the single most powerful tool that we've got in our, in our toolbox. Um, and so they work in tropical oceans, they work in the polar oceans, they're, they're applicable anywhere. They're also quite easy to, to, to communicate, I think, because if I talk to um, other parents at the school gates or whatever, I say, well, they're a bit like national parks on, 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 uh, that you have on land at the sea, and, you know, people kind of get it. But fishermen don't get it, at least not at first for the most part because uh, they have this other idea of the, uh, of the freedom of the seas that has been there, uh, uh, as Charles said, since Grotius' time. And um, they've been highly resistant because uh, their whole thing is, is that, yes, you know, the seas are ours, uh, 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 ours, ours, to, ours to fish. Um, so we started sort of... Uh, marine reserves were very essential. Uh, uh, but they're not going to be the, the solution to everything. It doesn't mean that the rest of your, your oceans, you can do what you like. You need your activities to be sustainable there uh, and, and equitable. So really, if we want to save the oceans, what we need is a sort of emergency oceans rescue package. And uh, basically what we're calling for is a, a, a global network of marine reserves that covers 40% of the oceans. That figure was taken as we, we looked through the scientific literature and the sort of, basically what the science was saying is, was that the sort of maximum benefits come between 20 and 50% and we thought, well, we'll go near the upper end because we know we're going to, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a good provocative number, it'll, 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 it'll create a space, but also, you know, we know that it will be hard negotiation. So we put this incredibly ambitious sort of figure out there. For the 60%, we have a, a, a much more sort of complicated set of things that need doing. We want, we want sustainable fisheries. You can't, fisheries management uh, has been clearly pretty unsuccessful. We've heard about ICATCH, you know, uh, uh, this management body um, that's supposed to look after the Atlantic tuna where there's basically no tuna left. And there are all these other bodies we've got fisheries collapses where, where, wherever we look. 
This management is all based on looking at single species. And really we need to sort of look at, uh, 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 at the whole ecosystem, which is another reason why marine reserves are good, is they're, uh, they're an ecosystem protection management. But we need to look uh, at, at how fisheries uh, affect other species. We heard about deep sea trawling, you know, where basically you, you, you know, where we've got trawlers going over ancient coral reefs, and Alex can tell you all about this. And it's, um, I can't remember who said this, maybe, maybe Callum, you know, it's, it's, it's like going for those fish is like hunting deer by sort of cutting down the forest. You're, you're basically getting rid of the, the, these essential habitats. So we need to, to look at fisheries in a completely different way. There are too many, you know, if you, if you just make marine reserves and do, don't do anything about the number of fishing boats, mm -hmm. there are too many fishing boats. We need to reduce capacity. We need to get rid of these really destructive fishing gears, like bottom trawlers and uh, uh, bottom trawling. Go for selective gears. So we need to improve that. We've got to stop subsidising, you know, these the, 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 these these fisheries, and we need a whole new set of rules. Uh, for the, for the ocean and particularly the high seas where it's a bit of a wild west there are these funny management bodies that are sort of well ICAT's responsible for tuna in the Atlantic but what about all the other fishing activities and other species and what about the other industries what about oil drilling and we've got to have a much more comprehensive and, and cohesive way we look, look at the high seas so since 2004 when we started off in the North Baltic seas I've been running Greenpeace's Marine Reserve campaign we've got other campaign largely focused on overfishing and the other 60%. Um, we started in the Northern Baltic Seas, we talked about 40%. We were basically viewed as lunatics, but fairly soon afterwards, the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution in this country came up with uh, a suggestion that 30% of the UK waters should be closed to fishing. We've seen, you know, the science is there, and there is, in fact, political recognition of the, uh, of the need for, for marine protected areas and marine reserves. Um, the world's governments have agreed under the Convention of Biological Diversity and uh, the World Summit for Sustainable Development to create a network of marine protected areas, including strictly protected areas by 2012, that should cover 10% of the oceans. Um, so, the, so the sport's there, but as you pointed out, um, What's, what's the reality? And then the answer is 5.9%, I think, uh, uh, of national and territorial waters are under some kind of protection, and 0.5% of the high seas. So we've started work in the North and Baltic Seas. We've now got campaigns in, in, in India where we're working particularly with small-scale artisanal fishermen because one of the other things we've got to address is this issue of equity. The global north is taking the fish from the global south. We've got campaign in, in Chile, again, where we're working with local fishermen. We're working in the US, um, up in the Bering Sea, where we found, you know, people say, well, there's nothing out there to protect. You know, we've taken submarines to these canyons in the Bering Sea. We found new species, um, you know, which is then backing our case for, for, for marine reserves. But we're also working in, in, the, in the regions. We're working in the Mediterranean and we're working in the Pacific. And what our work there has shown is that, yes, we're making progress. A lot of the Pacific Island states who are absolutely dependent in their economies for their, their tuna um, want to close these areas of ocean, these high seas pockets that are international waters between their, their national waters. If you look at a map of the Pacific, you'll see these little pockets. Because what they're finding was that um, fishing vessels were going into their waters, taking fish, and then sort of going into the international waters and saying, oh, we've, we, we, we've caught the, the fish there. So they want to close those and make them marine reserves. And in fact, they've got so far, in as much as they've closed these areas to per se fishing through the regional management body. But that body is only responsible for, for tuna fisheries. Um, it can't make them real marine reserves, and it's an incredibly complicated thing to do. And all uh, most waters have some kind of uh, management regime, but it's piecemeal. They're organisations that were set up really to, to help fishing and to carve up the fisheries pie, not to protect the, protect the resource, protect the environment. And it's all a hodgepodge and, and piecemeal and pretty crap. And if you go up to the Arctic, you know, there's, there's, there's 
nothing there for instance and as the ice is melting in fact you're just watching all these fishing vessels and we found 12 Russian trawlers fishing north of Svalbard last year in, in, in waters that have never been never been never been fished so what we need I think uh, 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 for the high seas is um, to go to the UN and uh, we need a global campaign to basically get in place there is a, a, a United Nations law of the sea that covers all sorts of things everything from seabed mining to navigation and to defines you know what's national waters what's what's high seas etc but there's there's no bit that um, although there are clauses within the, the, the United Nations law of the sea there's no bit that really implements those values of protection of the high seas uh, which is why Greenpeace is working with uh, Communications Inc and a whole bunch of other NGOs in the High Seas Alliance to try and uh, get a mechanism for creating marine reserves on the high seas and get an, a, a truly global governance system that puts protection of the marine environment at its core. What this would mean is effectively that an awful lot of um, people who currently make their livelihoods out of, out of fishing uh, would not be able to uh, in the future. I sat in a room in, in Brussels last week with you know, uh, the, the fisheries uh, commissioner <laughs> and with hundreds of uh, fishermen and people from the fisheries industry and you know, they, they were horrified, not because they, they, they want to, to destroy fish stocks, but because, uh, you know, this is their, their livelihood, this is, this is their job, and they'd like to still have a job. Well, the fishing industry, I think, as a whole, is doing itself out of a job. You know, there is the point, you know, when they fish so far down, the, 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 the food chain will be eating jellyfish, you know. Mm. Cod aren't as big as they used to be when I was a, uh, a, a kid. But I think when we're talking about um, fishermen, I, I think what you'll find is that a lot of small-scale fishermen are pretty much like us, and they're the people we tend to be friendly with. And the people who don't like us are actually big business. Um, and when you're talking about the high seas, we're not talking about uh, local coastal peoples. What we need to do is to make a system whereby coastal peoples can benefit from their, their, their fisheries and have sustainable fisheries that last for the next generation and the generation after that. And we need to get rid of this sort of excess uh, capacity. Um, so these really big sort of trawls so that go out from uh, years of they're, they're a complete, yeah. you know, they're not equivalent to your, your people going out in, a, in Africa in a pirogue, mm -hmm. you know, to, 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 to feed, feed their family. It's a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how, how, how the Global North treats the Global South is a, is a major issue. Yeah. And, you know, somehow we've got to... You know, for instance, in the Pacific, we're, we're you know, really trying to help empower the, the Pacific yeah. governments to have more contr control over their waters. Thank you. We've yeah, got I a point here from Alex. I just, just um, yeah. add to, to what Rich has just said. There's a yeah. fascinating uh, new study that's just been published on uh, fishing in the Azores Islands, actually, oh, okay. um, Portugal, where uh, what they found there is that the uh, large scale industrial fisheries are basically declining. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the old methods of fishing are coming back in. And it turns really? out, from a study of the uh, economics of this whole process, that these old style fisheries are actually more profitable. They employ vastly more people than the large, large vessels in the region. And the whole operation is much more sustainable. Yeah. And I, I think when we start talking about these things, we've got to, got to really bear in mind that first of all, many of these fishing operations are heavily subsidized. Yeah. Uh, fuel in particular is heavily subsidized. Uh, uh, the modernization of fleets from small vessels to large has been heavily subsidized in Europe. So it's actually our taxes that have been paying these people to overfish. Yeah. It's complete madness. And, and uh, one of the things that we really have got, got to get used to doing is actually having some form of policy yeah. uh, to determine what we're doing with these fisheries. If we want a fishery to employ the maximum number of people, then there's a certain way to manage that fishery. Yeah. If we want that fishery to uh, produce the maximum economic benefit, then we manage it in a different way. And uh, quite frankly, up to now, Europe has lacked that policy behind uh, the way that they've been running their yeah. fisheries. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, 
Did you want to jump to there, say or, or we've got a question here? Yep. In the North Sea now, they reckon it takes four, um, over four barrels of oil to catch one barrel of fish, and it's purely subsidy which allows it to happen. And the other fact which I heard, factoid that I heard uh, not so long ago, authoritatively, was that um, the money got from the British fishing industry is about the same as the British glasshouse cucumber business. Now, it's a matter of perception, lobby, organising. It's a noble, brave, ancient sort of occupation and this sort of stuff. There's a lot of play, but if you want to employ more people, you've got it. Well, Alex explained it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for that. Now we've got a question here and then I'll take a question here. Yes. Hi. I'm, I don't mean to be um, to ask a very ignorant question. It'd be very obvious. But I wonder whether, um, you know, the, the fisheries are fishing themselves out of business and ultimately we're avoiding the, the question of uh, managing demand because the consumers are us. We can talk about how bad it is to overfish our oceans and what we're doing to them, but we go home and eat fish once a week. Um, or maybe more often than that. Yeah. So perhaps increasing taxes and having a proactive uh, government policy to pay £10 for a kilogram of cod, for example, because it's not sustainable. Well, that's, a, that's a brilliant question. I'd like to, to, to put that uh, to our panel. And I'd, I'd like, um, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to add to that question because, um, I, it, you know, you're talking about uh, the government sort of uh, stepping in on this, but actually at the moment the government advises us to eat, I think it's two or three mm. portions of fish a week. And in fact, we get more and more research uh, seems to be coming out showing that not only is, you know, as, as, as your granny used to say, fish is good for your brain, but apparently, um, you know, uh, fish oils are actually essential to uh, our development, to the development of, of small uh, children, babies in the womb and, and small children and so on. And um, we seem to find out more and more every day about how much we need fish in our diet, even as we're, we're, we're killing them. Um, and the, an idea of, uh, of raising the price of fish um, would actually be very controversial because it might put this essential uh, nutrient out of the reach uh, of uh, low-income people, which you know would, would be a very bad thing. So how do we solve this conundrum? By dispelling yeah. that myth. Oh, go on. Fish are, do contain essential, essential nutrients, but it's yeah. not only fish that do it. Okay. You're talking about omega threes and things like that. I, I think mm -hmm. partly, um, you know, oil seed rape and all these. Uh, they will do the job as well. Now, drinking a pint of oil seed rape oil is not quite anyone's idea of a good time, but <laughs> it's it's got to happen. I mean, we think today the population is going up to what was it, 10 billion now, 9 billion now? Yes, is <laughs> are the new estimates. Um, it's it's going to be. Um, Someone agrees with you. <laughs> <laughs> Something has got to kind of change. I, I think yeah. that the answer is, when you have a marine protected area, the productivity of fish goes up yeah. threefold, fourfold, fivefold. Mm -hmm. Everybody wins. In the Philippines, we've been engaged with things where yeah. people, um, well, they oppose it at first. You're stopping me doing what my father and grandfather did before me. When the government does stop it, they realise after two years, three years, there's a quadrupling of both the amount of fish they get and their income. Then they become the best ambassadors for it. And if another villager you know, starts to poach, they beat him up. That's good sort of management, you know, <laughs> Philippine style. Mm -hmm. They do. It, it does work. And you can increase the stock fourfold once you get off the floor. Once you get off the ecological floor. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I'll take Alex and, and then Richard. They, they, yeah. they, they, uh, I mean, Charles is getting to the nub of the point. If we manage the oceans well, it's food for free. That, that's mm. the absolutely maddening thing about this whole matter of overfishing. Uh, in terms of food security, we could be managing the oceans to produce much more. There are figures around that we're fishing for less than the last 10% of fish around the coast of Britain. And in fact, I think for some commercial species, we've taken out something like 97% of the biomass. It's absolute, absolutely crazy. And many of us don't realise it because of something called the shifting baseline. And this is that we get used to the fact that there's very few fish in the ocean. We have no idea what it was like back at, uh, in, in the early part of the 20th century or even before that. And in fact, the seas were brimming uh, with fish in many parts of the world. We've just got used to an ocean without them. So if the oceans are protected and are managed 
in a good way, then we can actually uh, secure uh, that food for the future. Yes, that's a very interesting point. I believe that um, you know, in, in Dickensian London, um, oysters were actually the cheapest form of food, weren't they? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. were lobsters in North America, they were yeah. junk. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So, so I, I just think you hit on a very important point: is sort of what we do as consumers, and I think we do have to eat less fish. I don't eat anything like the amount of fish I did 20 years ago. Uh, you know, uh, and there are, we've done a lot of work in the UK w with sort of markets and using consumers to change companies' uh, purchasing policy to eliminate the worst kinds of. Uh, 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 of fish from their shelves to get them to have sustainable policies. Uh, some of you may recently have seen uh, the second part of Hugh's fish fight on telly uh, and the tuna and how you know we got a commitment from Tesco's the day before we were about to do a whole big public campaign on Tesco's that they're going to change uh, from fishing with these uh, fish aggregating devices and, and purse saints and going out to Poland line. And so we've got that, you know, the power of the consumer is something we should definitely harness. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we've got a question here and then I'll come to the question at the back here. Hi, uh, my name's Toby Kennett. I was lucky enough to be able to trade in wonderful fresh British prime fish about 15 years ago. Um, and I sold to restaurants in the West End and it became uh, clear to me that about half of the fish eaten in the trade, but also at home, in London, that long ago was from farmed sources. And we've not heard much about fish farming. It's not a popular subject. I think people do think it's uh, uh, fish farming is uh, a problem that occurs rather than a solution that occurs. Um, so I'd be interested to know uh, what the panel have to say about fish farming and its role, not only in the UK but globally. But a second question as well for Richard, which is the you mentioned the United Nations Conference on the law, of, uh, no, the uh, United Nations Law of the Sea, and there was a famous UNCLOS United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea some years ago. Is there any talk of a new one um, which might provide the kind of overarching uh, support mechanism for some of the solutions that? Uh, uh, you've been advocating and that we all obviously support. Thank you for that. Thanks. Um, two questions. Uh, can there be such a thing as good fish farming for a start? And then uh, about the law of the sea. Well, the problem with fish farming is that we get all, all there are two kinds of fish farming is, is whether you're taking the food that you feed your farm fish on from the oceans because basically you're, you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul in those cases and that's different so it's, it's what 10 tons of fish meal to mm. produce one ton of farmed fish something like that it's, it's, to one or something yeah it's something pretty right. severe it depends yeah. what, the, what, the, what the species is etc yeah. so it's kind of a, a false solution the, the, the aquaculture industry has done a sort of a, a fantastic job of selling it uh, as, as a solution to the ocean overfishing over problem. And what we're seeing in terms of global fisheries is, is, is the marine capture uh, goes down so aquaculture is, is, is going, going up. Um, that said, you know, mussels, they're good. Um, <laughs> as, to, as, as, to, as to, you know, they're just cleaning, cleaning the muck out of the water or the sewage, as my dad always used to say. Um, as, as to the, the UN conferences, there have been a series of UN meetings where everybody knows that these issues have to be addressed, but there's a bit of an impasse politically because of different different issues, and we've kind of got to get them over this hurdle and get that negotiating process. But we've done it once before with something called the Straddling Fish Stocks Agreement, which was a, an implementing a, a, a bit of UN legislation that fulfilled some of the UNCLOS mandate, we now need to do this big thing that sort of a UN high seas biodiversity agreement or something. It needs a better name than that because otherwise every single person who isn't a nerd will be lost in the first hurdle. But you know what I mean. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Now we've got a, a, a question here at the back. We're, we're going to start to run out of time in a minute, so I'm going to start taking two questions at once. So question here and then it, you in the corner, sir. Yep. <coughs> Uh, I myself um, have changed my diet. I eat mackerel now, so I'm not saying we should just carry on gorging on fish. But really, changing our diets surely is, is equivalent to wearing a hair shirt. It's not going to stop the trawlers down the coast of the Madagascan coast buying all the fish and destroying that. So 
I don't really understand what us changing our consumer habits will do for this total devastation in town. Can I just ask, when you say us, do you mean sort of us people in this room, us in this country, or us in the whole world? Uh, let's say us in this country. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll give the panel a chance on that in a second, but first we'll take a second question. We've talked a little bit about uh, international treaties, um, talked a little bit about the consumer, but I would like to hear the panel's thoughts on domestic British politicians. Um, as far as yeah. I'm aware, uh, in my lifetime, I haven't come across a single politician that's really cared about the ocean. Yeah. At the moment, there's a massive policy disconnect between the work of DEFRA and the work of the Department for Energy and Climate Change. Um, yeah. I'd like to know what the panel thinks we can do as consumers and as concerned environmentalists. Lobby the politicians who thought that uh, they'd be very familiar with lobby groups that represent the likes of Findus and Young, etc. And Hugh Fansley Whittingstone, great guy, but um, he's not an extremely competent campaigner. I mean, his free range should have been taken back by quite a massive bit. Where does the next campaign come from? Um, how do we lobby the politicians as concerned consumers and environmentalists? That's a fantastic question. Are there any politicians in the room? <laughs> well, that just proves your point. None of them care. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Excellent. What I think we, we should ask you what the answer is. <laughs> well, we, we, we can take suggestions. Um, make suggestions. But um, uh, if, if there's anyone who'd like to, to make a suggestion uh, from the panel on this, on what we can do with, uh, with politicians. And also, um, panellists, what about this question of, actually, it doesn't make any difference what we do uh, in this country. Changing our diets won't have any effect. Alex? I'll, uh, I'll certainly address that one. Um, I've worked extensively on deep water fisheries, and most deep water fish are uh, basically caught and flow into luxury markets. And those are markets like UK, Europe and the US. And I think actually a, a change in demand from consumers as to what they want to see in their shelves has really had an impact on the demand for some of those species. People don't want to eat a 200 year old fish that's come off a coral garden on top of an underwater mountain. And if we can get messages like that across, I think the consumers pretty quickly tell the supermarkets and, and fishmongers and so on that they're simply not buying those type of fish. Um, in, a, in a wider sense, I think every little bit helps. And, and if we're talking about the UK effectively, we're talking about part of the European Union. And given that the European Union is one of the big importers of fish from the south, I think that we can very much have an impact on what's going on uh, both nationally and within Europe and also internationally uh, if we demand that, that the fish that, that we're eating uh, are taken from a sustainable source. Um, there are a yeah. few politicians who do care about fisheries. Mm. The yeah. problem is finding them. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can bet that the yeah. lobbyists know who they, they are. Mm. But they don't tend to be in do they? No. 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 <laughs> um, right, we, we had another. I'm going to very quickly just take uh, th these last questions uh, and then I'm going to give uh, our, 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 our panellists just a, a chance to say a, a last thing. Yeah. Yeah, just a. One point, I think the science advisor to the Prime Minister is actually uh, a marine biologist by, by origin, so he knows quite a lot about this subject. Um, yeah. He had his own he had his own charity, which yeah. uh, I investigated some oh time boy. ago. Oh boy! The the other <laughs> point I'd like yeah. to make is is one which has fascinated me for some time, and that is that about 15 to 20 percent of the world's proteins eaten are fish, mm -hmm. and I'd love to see the headline in the Guardian that says "Fish don't fart." Because in fact, as we as we deplete our fish sources, <laughs> apparently it is. As we deplete our fish sources, our reliance on land-based protein is going to increase. Mm -hmm. Notably in China, where people are eating more and more meat. Yeah. And guess what meat does? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's a that's a very good point. And I, I know I have a mission in life in terms of uh, headlines. Uh, there was a question here, and yeah, and then behind you, yeah. Um, as a vegan, I kind of want to know if I have it right. Um, scientifically and ecologically speaking, would it be most beneficial to take nothing from the oceans for human consumption to keep the balance? Or is there kind of a safe amount of fish we can take, also speaking of overfishing? 
thank you very much. That's a very good question. And we had a final question uh, from the lady here. Thank you. If you could pass the mic along. Thanks very much. Um, if we were able to control pollution and overfishing, but we weren't in the same way able to, to control emissions and say we went on an A1, F1 emissions scenario out into the future, what would coral reefs look like? And are there adaptation strategies for reefs in the way that there are on land? Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Um, okay, um, first of all, uh, is there a, a safe amount that we can take from the oceans? Is, is there, would anyone like to, to jump in on that? Hmm. What, what, well, I, I, I think there is, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, it, there's no doubt fisheries can be managed yeah. in a sustainable way, but it's got to be done in a, a whole ecosystem context. There's something yeah. called ecosystem-based management, and that involves the implementation of things like marine protected areas, yeah. uh, friendly forms of, of extraction, um, to really pay attention to all of the impacts of, of those fisheries and to really look after the environment. Um, so yeah. if we take care, we can do it. Yeah. yeah. And there's Charles, I'd like there. you to just... Well, there is a caveat yeah. with that, yeah. though, is yeah. recently, it's not published yet, but there's going to be a study out soon showing that what you can take from a reef, a fishery, basically, is about 20-25% of what people thought they could take. So right. you do have safe amounts, but it's sort of distressingly small compared to what you would hope, maybe, if you don't want to cause the ecosystem to fall over. Thank yeah. you. And just on that question of reefs, uh, we had the other question about, you know, can... The future of reefs. Yes. What right. The CO2 going into the ocean is warming it, which causes episodic mass mortalities. The other, and you see that that year, the trouble with the acidification is that there is a lag of about 30 years. And even if we stabilize the CO2 now, the pH would still drop for the next 30 years. Already the Great Barrier Reef, for example, is uh, calcifying. It's lost about 30% of its amount of calcification with the pH drop that we've had, which is only 0.1, it doesn't sound much. It's still about a 30% increase in the amount of acidity in the water. Um, the safe limit for CO2 in the atmosphere at equilibrium with the oceans, if you're going to have calcifying things, so you're eating fish and chips, not jellyfish and chips, right, mm -hmm. is um, 350 parts per million in the atmosphere. What have we got now? Yesterday it went up to about 380, or 387, which way around is it? Uh, the Copenhagen meeting allegedly failed because they couldn't reach agreement. I'm very glad they didn't because they were going to all be cosy and say, let's settle on 450. Mm -hmm. That would be suicide for the oceans. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of us sent in things saying, if you do agree to 450, it's suicide. 350 is the limit. So the prognosis isn't good. And if you want to see what a reef looks like, well, you see me afterwards, I'll show you... Um, uh, sort of where to go for a lot of them, which are, or have already reached that state because of warming more than acidification at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, okay, we're, we're wrapping up now. I'm about to let you go, but uh, before we do, I'm just conscious that we didn't answer the political question, so I'm just going to give our panellists uh, one final word. You've got a sentence each, uh, and I'm going to ask you, first of all, what kind of fish do you eat? just so we know. And secondly, I'm going to ask you, there's one thing that people in the room can do, uh, and speak, thinking in particular of you know persuading politicians uh, and so on, there's one thing that people can go away and do, what should they do? I'm going to take you first, Richard, and I'm going to move along. Uh, I have had mackerel this year. Okay. And uh, in terms of one thing you can do, I think... The best thing you could probably do is go to the Greenpeace website, take whichever oceans action uh, is, is up there now as a cyber activist. You will then receive loads more things that you can do and you can follow the, the issue on a global basis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Charles. What you can do is lobby. We lose out in lobbying all the time. The industry are very good at it. They pay a fortune to do it. Half the price of the fish you do buy is because of the surcharge. They put it into lobbying. If we lobby, we might start to turn the tables a bit better than we are. We're not very good at it. And when you say lobby, do you mean... Uh, right to your members of parliament, right to Tesco's and things like that. An MP... Um, well, the, the, uh, 
I think the folk story in MP land is that if they get five letters on a subject, they take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Okay, well there's more it, than five. It doesn't need many. There we go. Okay, thanks for that. Alex. Well, I'm a you, great didn't, you didn't tell us what fish you eat, do you? Well, I don't normally, actually. There you go. That's very telling. I wear the hair shirt. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm about to reveal that actually my uh, grandfather and several of my uncles were fishermen. Ah. So, um, yeah, that's... Uh, I'll admit to it now, it's all coming out, I guess, but, um, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I eat fish, squid, I particularly like eating, they're very fast growing, <laughs> unfortunately replacing fish in many ecosystems because we've wiped the fin fish uh, out. Um, I'm a great believer in every little thing that you do helps, and that's from everything from CO2 emissions to what you eat. I think the, uh, the chap who mentioned uh, the environmental impacts of eating meat, for example, is, is something which we should be very, very concerned about. And I think, in fact, food prices are going to mean we eat far less of those sorts of things in the future anyway. So um, people have already mentioned lobbying and cyber lobbying and so on. I just think you should look at everything you do and uh, try and reduce your impact wherever possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the well, last word to you, Don. Yeah, well, I eat uh, organic salmon when I can find it, but uh, only if it's a, if only if it's certified as sustainable. Um, in terms of what we can do, I mean, I think we should all try to induce, reduce our environmental footprints. I mean, the developed north has an enormous footprint compared to the developing south. Uh, the UN published a study not too long ago that said if everybody had the same standard of living as the average North American, it would take three planet Earths to provide all the resources and, and, and space for waste. So I think if everybody's aware of your footprint, we can start reducing it person by person. I think that's one place to start. Another thing that's happening in the U.S. in terms of coastal communities is that they're actually getting coalitions of people together just to lobby for changes in local legislation. So they're lobbying their congressmen, they're lobbying the politicians, uh, they're lobbying the, the governors, uh, the state, the state political apparatus as well as the national, and trying to make a real difference in terms of the management of coastal resources. I think this is beginning to have a, you know, a little bit of impact, but there are more and more communities that are doing this, and that's a positive <coughs> sign. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I think we're ending there on a rather more hopeful note than, uh, than we began. Um, there are uh, some uh, astonishingly critical problems out there, but hopefully we can all do a little bit uh, to at least uh, help to, to save them. And if we could get to this goal of having 40% uh, of the wow. oceans protected, um, then that would be a massive, massive achievement. Uh, I'm going to hand you over now to... Just, just before everybody leaves, um, thanks to Comzinc, our partners on this, there's a free a uh, glass of wine for everybody downstairs uh, so we can continue the discussion down there with the panel. Right. Thank you very much. Very nice Thanks to our panelists.